Yeah, please enjoy your three-course meal um, from the Vinoy. And as you know, because some, if not many of you, are involved in some of our leadership forums, um, Dr. Key, uh, it, it goes on and on, but she speaks in front of Fortune 500 companies, government entities, PhD from University of Virginia, Cavaliers, uh, BS from University of Massachusetts. When you think about women in not just our market, but nationally, who've made a real impact on other women and helped them with peer groups and a safe place to talk about challenges and successes and introductions, you think about Dr. Mary Key. And she's, you know, renowned throughout uh, the nation, but here in our market, I, I, I can't name names, but I told a friend who's very involved in startups and entrepreneurship that I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Mary Key speak speak to the Benoit Business Alliance in November. And of course, in the f last few years, she's known so much for her, her, her women's leadership and her, her, her now her new book, Season Success, A Woman's Guide to Transformational Leadership. But what this gentleman told me was, in her early days of executive coaching, there were men and women in the group, and some of these men have gone on to have tremendous successful entrepreneur careers. Now she just focuses all the attention with, with women helping them get to their next level of success. But uh, your reputation definitely precedes you, Mary. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our returning speaker, Dr. Murky. And remember, when the talk is over, she'll autograph your book. Right. So don't, you know, don't run out at 1.30. Go back and see Mary. Thank you so much. Mike, please. Wow, it's so exciting to be here with you today. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, new faces, uh, a lot of familiar faces. I'm so honored uh, to be here. Well, for over 25 years now, I've had the opportunity to serve as an executive coach, a consultant, and a trusted advisor to a lot of people in leadership roles. And when I first started out, Maybe 30 years ago, I moved here right from graduate school and worked with a consulting firm. And in that work, I really observed that the challenges that leaders face are common, but there's some unique challenges that women in leadership face that others uh, don't necessarily experience. Some of them can be looked at as pitfalls and there are things that we can do to address some of those. And others, I, I believe women, are uniquely poised to be the transformational leaders now and into the future. So today, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, leadership and women in leadership, some of the challenges, and I wanna hear from the room because I know I'm preaching to the choir to some extent. And, and then I'd like to talk about some strategies that men and women in the room can use uh, or be reminded of to be even more effective as a leader now and into the future. So I want to uh, tell you very briefly a little bit about my background because it relates to how uh, what I'm going to talk about today. And Mike alluded to it. I started out with a consulting firm, did a lot of work traveling around the, the world, really. Uh, they uh, used me as a, a young person who uh, was very enthusiastic about an expense account. And so I would, uh, <laughs> I would work crazy hours, come home, do laundry, and then leave Sunday night or Monday morning to do it all over again. Um, so in, in that work, uh, as I advanced in leadership roles, I got to, to work with C-suite folks. Uh, the predominant ones at the time were male, and uh, not bashing men at all. I love men. I'm married to one over here, uh, <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> uh, our marketing director is one, too. Uh, <clears throat> and I really felt like this leadership thing's important, but it seems like when I work with the women in leadership roles, there's some differences. And if fast forward, I went to another firm, continued that work, and then when I started my own practice, one of the things that I did is that I wanted to work with entrepreneurial organizations a little bit more because Florida's got a lot of them, and I was getting a little tired being on the road all the time. And so uh, 
I had an opportunity, a colleague of mine introduced me to Inc. Magazine. So I helped Inc. Magazine set up CEO roundtables around the country. And in that work, I got to meet a lot of hard-charging CEOs. And here locally, and some of you that are local might know some of the CEOs, we had an all-technology CEO group. And so we had people like Tom Wallace, who now runs Florida Funders. Uh, he had a company called uh, Waldac and, and then... Um, uh, had other iterations of businesses. Uh, we had Tony Benedetto that started Tribridge, who he sold. And we had one woman that just kept me sane, and I'm so honored that Nancy Ravenall, Nancy, raise your hand, is here in the room. She was in that group of, of nine hard-charging uh, CEOs. And what I, what I noticed, and why this is important to the talk, is that those people all felt like they were lonely in some way. It was lonely at the top. And you could talk to your spouse or partner or friends. You could talk to people at work. But everybody kind of had a vested interest and didn't really get what those uh, leaders needed. And so uh, they stayed together so long because they, they helped each other grow their businesses. Now, with that particular group and, and other CEO groups, which unfortunately were predominantly male, despite my best efforts to get more women in, in, uh, uh, into those forums, but one of the reasons is that their companies were a little larger. And a lot of women in business have smaller uh, firms and, and they're, or they're solo entrepreneurs. So um, I noticed that um, that dynamic that brought them together actually served as a peer support. Well, I was doing all this work with the, with the CEO groups and I was doing the consulting work and partnering on different projects and I had quite a pace. And then the world stopped me. Very flattering picture of me I'm gonna show you. That's me at the Cleveland Clinic I, uh, after my first open heart surgery. Uh, since I was a child, I had an issue with my heart valve and um, you know, it's, it became a regurgitation, and then in 2013, my cardiologist said, it's time, and I said, it's time for what? And he said, it's time uh, that you got your valve repaired because your heart's getting too large for your chest cavity, and you're gonna get congestive heart failure as you get older, so you need to go. So I was, you know, always in good shape, and they, you know, my prognosis was very good. So I went and had the surgery, and I didn't get better and I didn't get better. And uh, um, size two clothing was falling off me. I looked like I had been in some type of concentration camp. And finally in 2014, they realized that I had endocarditis, which um, debilitated me for a while. And there's something called, and we have some wonderful people from Baycare, <laughs> Diane Laria, who uh, ha has been part of Key Associates in the past. And, gone on to medical career, nursing, I know. And so without belaboring the endocarditis part, the thing I want to tell you is there's a condition that all of us, well, there's an ejection fraction in your heart and normal's between 52 and 76. And mine was 26. So to, to share with you what that means is your heart has enough juice to sort of open and then try to close. And so if it's normal, it's doing this, but mine wasn't. So the doctor said, hey, you know, you really need to think about what you want to do because I'm not sure you're ever going to be able to keep your schedule again. He was nicely telling me that I was going to be retiring early, I think. So I got to thinking about what is it that I really am passionate about? What do I love doing? I love the coaching. I love the working with people in the leadership roles. I love the work with uh, leaders in roundtables. And I love working with women. I've always been a big supporter of women. Um, obviously, I am one, but there's a, something about what women bring to the table that has always been special to me. So that's when I started one of our first key women's leadership forums. And we actually have, I'm very honored, uh, a host of uh, people, present and past forum members. Can I ask you just to raise your hand, please? Thank you for being here today. So, 
The reason I wanted to tell you all this is that the focus on women in leadership became more tense. And as I worked with these leadership forums, we now have 10 running. We have um, other facilitators besides myself, very skilled. And I began to look at, okay, well, what's really going on for women? And then it culminated, of course, in my, in my book, Seizing Success. And I want to talk about a couple of the pitfalls, external ones and then internal ones. So one big one is that women are underrepresented um, in the workplace. So we thought at one point that if we had more women with business degrees, things would change. About one third of all the MBAs right now are women. And yet about 2% of the CEOs in publicly traded companies and 8% of the senior leadership are actually women. Now, there are more women in um, non-publicly traded companies in senior roles, okay? However, with the pandemic, uh, McKinsey just came out with a study, one in four women uh, that are in leadership roles are looking at seriously down-tracking their careers, shifting downward, or leaving entirely. The other issue that we all still face is for every dollar a man makes, Mike, a woman makes 79 cents. And if you're a woman of color, it can be less than that. That's still there. Crazy, I know. And um, so this, this whole area of underrepresentation is serious, and then when you layer on top of it, the unconscious bias that uh, we sometimes have about women. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, heard of the Heidi Howard study? Anyone? Okay. Well, it was, it was popularized a little bit. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg, which is I'm talking about Facebook right now, is probably <laughs> controversial, but it's, it's in the context of, it's in the context of, uh, of this uh, particular study. Uh, she popularized it, but it, it was done at How, um, How, uh, Harvard, and MBA students were given a case study, one of the, fav the famous Harvard case studies, and uh, it was about an entrepreneur, real entrepreneur named Heidi Rosen. And so they gave half the MBAs the Heidi Rosen case, and they gave the other half, and these are all the MBAs at, How at Harvard, um, the Heidi case. So Heidi and Howard, that's the only difference in the case studies. So at the end of the, the semester, they polled all the students, and all the students agreed that the entrepreneur they had was a very talented, successful entrepreneur. And in fact, the people that got the Howard case study said that Howard was someone that they would love to work for or would like to have um, as a peer. To a statistically significant level, um, Heidi was not seen that way. There were comments like, she appears selfish. Yes, she's smart, but I'm not sure I'd ever want to work for her. Nothing was different in either case study except the sex of the person. So unconscious bias does exist. And what adds to it is there's a mismatch between what we see as a leader and characteristics that we expect of a woman. So if I asked you, what are some of the characteristics of an effective leader? Some of you might say assertiveness, decisiveness, what are some of the other things you might say? Kindness. A good CEO should be kind. Yeah. OK, well, you're getting into the other dimensions now. So that's good, but the, the softer ones. But also um, visionary. visionary going first by definition, right? So all the things that um, forceful, all the things that we kind of expect in a guy, and guys feel pressure on the other side, so I'm not guy bashing here, but that's a whole different talk. Um, in this case, you know, you, that lines up for you. Well, women, we're supposed to be conciliatory, kind, collaborative, sensitive, right? And when we become assertive, it can be very confusing. 
very confusing. In fact, um, for many women in uh, leadership roles, um, being assertive is seen as kind of shocking. Uh, Dr. Amy Cuddy out of Harvard, she wrote the book Presence, talks about how the more competent a woman is and promoted, the less liked she is, and the more like she is, the more her competence is questioned. So it's a double bind. It's not necessarily right, but it's an unconscious bias. It's a mismatch. And that's a challenge that women in leadership roles face. How many of you women identify with what I'm talking about here? All right. Doing my own little study here. Just a couple of additional things. The um, hours that um, women spend can be excessive and keeps us off the leadership track or from going to the next promotion. Even before the pandemic, uh, the burden of managing a household, if you had a partner, fell squarely on the, sh uh, the shoulders of women. Does anybody want to take a guess at the percentage, what percentage of the management of the household on average falls on the shoulders of the women? And when I say management, your partner may take Johnny to soccer practice, but it's somebody that looks at, okay, what's Johnny doing for the year? When are the checkups gonna be? Who, you know, who, yeah, who the coach is gonna be, all that kind of stuff. Somebody does that and making sure the groceries get bought. What percentage? 90%. 90. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's a little better than that. And a lot, of, a lot of men are stepping up to the plate, but 70, 70%, yeah about 70% of the management of the household. And that's if you have a partner. If you don't have a partner and you don't have family members that live next to you, it's 100%, baby. Um, and, and so many times women don't have the time to go play golf or do some of the things that on an informal level um, men get to do uh, so that it isn't like good or bad, but you get to know John, and you and John are talking about, you know, some deal going on, and um, all of a sudden, voila, and the woman's back home trying to manage the household. The other part, too, that happens is that when an organization, there's a lot of research on this, when an organization labels a woman as someone who is not available because she has to leave to take her kids somewhere, or she has to do something that's family related, even when she works long hours, the tendency is to see her in that original box. And so they say, I can't, I can't invest in developing this person because if I do, they may just get busy and not, not be around. So I'll, uh, it won't be a good return on my investment. And then women lack mentors and sponsors, especially sponsors. What's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? Yes? A mentor will coach them on how to Did everyone hear Doug? Yep. Nice, loud, booming voice there. And that's true. We need more sponsors for women. Someone is going to say. OK, yes. Um, what? A mentor is someone who mentors um, and, you know, in a, a specific skill area. A sponsor is someone who promotes that woman and is willing to recommend them. Like in succession planning, um, hey, you know, I'm going to be retiring in four years. Have you thought about Harriet? And let me tell you why I think she could be a good fit. So women need more sponsors. So those are some of the external variables. Let's get to some internal ones. This to me is how women are taught. And again, I'm talking in general here, so there are always exceptions. But we're taught to want to get those good grades. And our family expects it. I don't know about you, but I had to get all A's. And my brother, if he just passed, that was fine. 
you stayed out of trouble and passed, okay. And when you start pleasing someone, which I wanted to do very much to my mom, my mom became a single parent after my dad passed away. And, um, and so she was so happy when I got good grades. But you know what happens when you are constantly trying to be perfect? You don't want to take chances. You don't take risks. And one of the big things a leader has to do is take risks and not be worried about making a mistake, right? Seeing a lot of head shaking here on that. So taking risks is something that women need to do more of. And many of us are brought up to try to find that straight and narrow path. I can't tell you how many people in the search business I've talked with or people in organizations who say, we put this job posting out there and we, we get a lot of candidates, a lot of the male candidates maybe, you know, have half, 60% of what it's required, but they try. We have to go up to some of the women and say, hey, didn't you throw your hat in for this? And they're like, I'm not ready yet. I haven't finished being really good at what I'm doing now. And the, the crazy thing is that under stress, men become more, uh, ri take risks and women become even more risk adverse. So taking risks is a huge thing. And how we bring up our young girls is important. I want to just tell you a short example here. I had an opportunity to hear Sarah Blakely, uh, you know, the founder of Spanx, God bless Spanx, and uh, <laughs> wearing a pair right now. Uh, and she and she's, uh, said, you know, one of the reasons I'm a great CEO is because my dad would always sit, sit down with us at dinner and say, what mistakes did you make this week? And my brother and I would both talk about them. And making a mistake was fine. It's just making the same mistake and not thinking it through that had repercussions in her house. So that's one area that I think women can uh, build on. And even if you're uncomfortable. So I love this uncomfortable exercise because um, it makes a point. Some of you might have done this, but let me just ask you, fold your arms. Notice what arm is on top, right or left? Okay. Um, and then fold your arms with the opposite arm on top. How does that feel? Weird. Weird, yes. That's how it feels when you're changing a habit, like taking a risk. The other internal thing that women do that they can shift is how they talk to themselves. Critical inner voice. We are meaner to ourselves than we are to other people. You know, when, you, when you're talking about parenting and things, people are told, never say, Johnny, you're stupid. I always say, Johnny, when you take that orange and throw it at your sister, <laughs> right? So you have to give the behaviors, right? Well, we don't do that to ourselves. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of like we're having a bad hair day. It's not like, okay, today my hair's frizzy. It's like, oh, I look ugly. You know, so it's taking it to that to that extreme for a lot of women. And that critical inner voice um, <clears throat> can really lead to a condition that's very serious. Um, so, and some of you might know about it, it's called the imposter syndrome. Okay, men, men suffer from the imposter syndrome too. It can be temporary because you're in a toxic environment or it can be something that's always with you. But for the imposter, no matter how much success a person has, and a lot of women fall prey to it. In fact, a very famous woman, Jodie Foster, is a big proponent of talking about it because she felt like a lot of her career, of course, Academy Award winner and all the other things she's done, that she's been an imposter. So an imposter can't enjoy their success because it's always an external thing. It's always something else out there that's why I'm popular, why I'm doing well. And um, it, it's as if, like, People found out who I really was. They wouldn't give me this honor or they wouldn't give me this whatever, fill in the blank. So our critical, our critical voice is, is very, very important. And um, there's some uh, work done on self-compassion, how to be more self-compassionate. And so here's an interesting uh, statistic I didn't realize. I was reading a book about this and 
And uh, the statistic is, in meta-analysis of showing self-compassion, women, the, the women were, she was predicting women would be more self-compassionate to themselves than men would be to themselves. And actually, it's the opposite. Women are less self-compassionate to themselves than men are to themselves. So men, you got something going there. That's good. <laughs> Going to be more like you there. Key Associates, my firm, in 2016, we surveyed about 105 women, executive women, in Tampa Bay. And we asked them, what is it that um, keeps you up at night? What, what are the things that really get you most in your responsibilities as a senior leader? And among the first or second most frequently mentioned thing was pressure to perform. Feeling an intense pressure to perform and feeling scrutinized. And people made comments like, you know, I walk in the room and I'm with a peer, you know, we both have chief titles, and somehow I feel like I have to prove that I'm smart enough to have this job, this role, whereas the guy in the room, and you know, people assume that that person deserves that role until they screw up. Now, whether that's perception or reality, that drives that feeling of pressure to perform. And if you're always feeling a pressure to perform and you have to perform all the time, what happens to your work-life balance? Way out of whack. And the last area I want to ask you about, and um, this is one where I'm going to, I'm going to bet, I, I'll bet a significant, I'll bet a book <laughs> that, that the, the majority of the women in the ro this room have had this experience. Have you ever walked into a meeting and you're sitting there and maybe you thought about the, what you want to say and you brought an idea or suggestion and no response. It was like you never said it. Fifteen minutes later, a guy in the room says the same thing, and they go crazy over the idea. How many of you have had an experience somewhat like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's like we're not heard. In fact, when I was a young consultant, I, um, I had this wonderful neighbor across the street that was a model, mentor to me. She was 87. And uh, she had a career as a journalist in, a, in, in real estate. She had a, a, a really good real estate practice. And I would have a glass of wine with Katie periodically. And you know Katie. And um, I went over this one day and I told her about how I had brought up this suggestion. And I, was, I had really thought about it because it was like a regional meeting. And a, another consultant, John, said the same darn thing I did. And, and nobody heard me, and everybody got excited about his idea. Well, Katie had these, she always wore her hair up in a bun, and she took her glasses off, and she looked at me. She said, Mary, you take heart. Your idea was so good that people wanted to move it forward. Next time, you remind them that you had brought up the idea as well. So assertiveness is really an important issue, and part of it is that women don't always verbally feel heard. Now, in some of the research I did on the book, Seizing Success, A Woman's Guide to Transformational Leadership, the one interesting thing is that nonverbal assertiveness is better accepted in women than verbal assertiveness. So sit up, take up the room, feel your presence, make eye contact. Um, you know, the whole thing about mansplaining or, or however that, you know, not mansplaining, what is it, mans what is it? the spreading thing? Uh, well, you sit on, like, uh, men sitting on the subway and... Spreading. Yeah, it's spreading, yeah. So, the suggestion is for women, for these researchers, to spread out more and to just let their presence be there. So anyway, this whole area of leadership and what women can do, I want to share five things with you that may be helpful and... It's not just for women, it's for anybody in a leadership role. Some of these you might have heard of, others maybe not. But my goal is for you to take one thing today and try to make it a habit uh, to help you be even more effective. First one is framing. And we have to sometimes reframe our thinking or how as leaders 
other people are thinking about things. A frame is nothing good or bad. It's just our set of assumptions about an idea or how we're holding things. And so with, with reframing, you know, if we have um, oh, a belief that um, stress is bad, for example, then how do we frame that in such a way that, that the stress can be useful? There's this interesting study that was done. It was done on 30,000 people over eight years. And people were asked three simple questions. Do you experience stress? To what degree, low, medium, high, off the scale, high? And do you see stress as harmful or not? And the researchers went back and checked death records. Yes, death records. And found that 43% of the people after eight years that said they experienced high stress that, um, and, and they saw stress as harmful, died. And none of the people who said they experienced high stress but didn't see stress as harmful, there, was, there were no dead people in that group. So your frame can save your life or not. So framing is really important. And as a leader, sometimes we might have the bigger picture like, we're doing this initiative because um, it ultimately it's going to take our company to this new level or our organization to this new level. And you've got this picture and all the people on your team are working on it, but maybe they have this, like, little piece. And maybe their little piece is really monotonous. It's like, oh, you know, I have to go to the database, I have to do this, and, do, and, and, and they don't see it. And the, it's really, really important as leaders for us to say, you know, here's the big picture. Here's our vision. Let me tell you why what you're doing, which might seem really boring at times, is critical to our success. And I want to thank you. That, that, that reframing is very important. Uh, challenging your, your self-talk. And we, earlier, you know, so just, just look at the behavior. Just say, you know, I was a little off today. Mary, I'm talking to myself, I was a little off today, and I'm gonna forgive myself for that, but I made a mental note, I don't want that to happen again. Watch what you're saying to yourself. The um, area of acting as if, I, my, the first book I wrote, got my mouse pad here, remember mouse pads? Um, it was called The Entrepreneurial Cat, 13 Ways to Transform Your Work Life. And I use the analogy of the cat to talk about how you can be more proactive and entrepreneurial in your life, whether you were an entrepreneur or, you know, you worked for an organization. And one of the 13 ways um, is uh, to act as if. What does a cat do when you have a cat at home, and the cat, like, maybe, um, you know, is on a chair or something, and they decide to jump up on a bookcase. And they make the jump, and they fall. And they walk off. <laughs> they act as if. They act as if. And neuroscience supports right now that by changing your physiology, by smiling, by, by shoulders back, um, by just um, opening up, you're actually changing how you begin to feel. So that old adage, smile and the world smiles with you, and uh, cry and you cry alone, there's a lot of truth to that. Not just the energy that you're giving out, but also this importance of um, changing your phys physiology. And uh, some of the women in the room that are in the women's form uh, probably remember this from a coffee. Uh, some of you might have tried it, but I wanted to um, share just a couple quick ones uh, that we could all try uh, that can change your physiology positively. Um, again, Amy Cuddy in her book Presence talks about the importance of um, how when they looked at people going into a high-stress job interview, what, by doing certain things to their bodies ahead, and I'll tell you what those are in a minute, um, they did better than people who didn't do anything. So the things were, uh, one is called Wonder Woman. 
Okay, so if you want to stand, let's all do Wonder Woman together. Now this is going to feel, we're, we're going to just stand for about 10 seconds. But um, what she's recommending, male and female, is to do this for two minutes. So you need to go to a bathroom stall, <laughs> right, and, and do this. And then the second one, and probably uh, more comfortable for some of you, is called, uh, is the Universal Victory uh, symbol, th sign, you see this in Olympics all the time, and it's called starfish. So by holding a starfish pose before you go into a high stakes situation, makes all the difference. So have a seat, tell me, do you feel any different? So the, I think I've talked a lot about the take risks and act, but just remembering, okay, asking yourself, what's the best thing that can happen if I take this risk? What's the worst thing that can happen? And can I really live with the results? It might be hard, you know, it might be a hard thing to do, but can I live with the results and take that uh, uncomfortable uh, risk? So even the Marines have a policy where if you wait until you're getting 100% of the facts, you can, you can damage yourself, but you can severely um, put at risk the, the other uh, troops, the other platoons or, or whatever um, that you're with. You can tell I'm not a military person, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so what, what, they're, what, what they're really saying is, get 80% of the data, get most of the data that you can, but then, you got to act. And I think, you know, that's a good thing to think about too because sometimes, especially women, want to get all the facts before they take the risk and then the boat leaves, right? I see some head shaking. I like that. And then um, peer support. And we talked a little bit about the women's forum. This is one of our forums and, and you know. Yeah, Gwen Davy. yeah, she's, she's uh, in there. And Renee, and Renee Vaughn. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this, our forums meet um, once a month. Some of them are virtual, some of them are in person, some are mixed since the pandemic. Um, but you, you don't have to join one of the women's forums to have this kind of support. In fact, the last chapter of my book, Seizing Success, I talk about how you can set up your own forum uh, because women need peer support. If, we're, if we don't have like-minded peers with us, we begin to question ourselves. In fact, research done on that, w women who have peer support are actually more successful in their career and they rated themselves as happier. So getting that peer support and being able to have a confidential setting. That's why the leaning groups are okay, but why they're not is they're all done within an organization as opposed to a mix of diverse women coming together with no other issue. Because, you know, people want to be able to talk confidentially. And that's the other thing I do differently with the women's forums. We don't just focus on career and business, although we do. Um, it's the alignment of mind, body, spirit, and career that's important, the, the whole person. So I talked a little bit about some of the challenges and some strategies that all of you can perhaps employ in some way, or if you do, I want to reinforce it. And now I want to talk a little bit about why do I talk about transformational leader, leadership and why is it important? Well, I think transformational leadership is the best kind of leadership for all people. And a transformational leader is a little bit different in that they are willing to transform themselves in the process of leading, the team transforms, and if done well and with the right support, the organization can transform. So you have to be willing to not know where, the, where you're going to end up when you're a transformational leader. So a transformational leader creates a compelling vision or does that as part of a group. Here's a place where women can step up a little bit more, be a little bit more bold about what is our vision and um, you know, what, what part do we all want to play in it? Um, setting clear goals, providing feedback, collaborating, which women are you know, on all the scales are always superior in collaboration. Uh, they have a tendency to see the we more than the I. And again, I'm not speaking about all 
people the same, but I'm talking about generalities. Um, they, they lead change, uh, they frame work in such a way that people are motivated, and also they coach and develop others. And so I, I said to you that women are uniquely poised, and one of the reasons I believe that they are is um, Gallup, for example, did a lot of work on um, looking at some of the differences between men and women and found that women managers are, are better at developing potential in others. And they're also better at setting clear expectations, part of being transformation leader, right? Giving feedback and showing that person where they fit into things, as well as encouraging a more important team environment because of their capabilities of uh, collaborating. This is an interesting study and uh, one that was so comprehensive, done, done by two, two gentlemen before the pandemic, and it culminated in a book called The Athena Doctrine. And basically, they, they, they interviewed 64,000 people from 13 countries. And what they did is they, they took all these different traits of leadership, and they asked people to respond to them, and they did a factor analysis. And they found that the top 10 leadership competencies um, Eight were things that were traditionally feminine, eight of those competencies, and there were two that were seen as more traditionally um, masculine, which were decision-making and resilience. And so uh, what people also said is uh, two-thirds of the respondents said that the world would be a better place if more men thought like women. So I, I'm telling you this because it was so comprehensive and so well done. It was kind of a blip, but it, it's interesting. Now, the sex that we represent in our body is important, and we're talking about women uh, differently, but these traits are things for all people. So, um, you know, all of us as leaders, male or female, uh, whatever the sexual orientation, it's important to be able to look at what uh, folks are looking for, look at what's important, and uh, set goals to, to move toward those. So emotional intelligence came out as a big factor in those eight areas, things like empathy, things like collaboration, uh, things like um, being able to um, r respond sensitively, interpersonal sensitivity. And in those areas, women traditionally score higher in measures of emotional intelligence. And again, that whole area of inclusiveness. Uh, we want more women on teams because we want teams to be innovative. And we want more women to take risks because you can't be innovative until you, you take a risk, right? And a lot of risks, a lot of innovations have a history of not working out initially. So, the seeking support thing is really important. And I, I can't emphasize that enough because women who have support with other women do better in their careers and in their lives. It's that picture from one of our summits, having some fun. The whole area of taking action. I'm gonna take some action right now. Um, I put a dot on three chairs in the room and kind of know the locations, but I'm not exactly sure. The dots are half black and half yellow and they only, only the yellow half shows up. So if you wanna look under your chair, um, when I end today's talk, uh, you'll receive a complimentary book and I'm happy to sign it. So you have to get up and look under your chair. So in closing, just wanna make a, a couple of final points. It's important for all of us to encourage risk-taking in young women, especially. Um, avoid overemphasis on perfection. Please don't say to your daughter, why didn't you get an A this time? Okay, I mean, there might be a good reason, but um, maybe they're experimenting and it wasn't quite in the syllabus. And um, offering support and sponsorship, both men and women to men and women, but especially um, women to women and, and men to women. So I'd like to leave you with a couple thoughts. Uh, one is to, to do one brave thing today. 
take one thing and try it out. And you know, if it blows up, kind of like that's gonna blow up, so be it. I wanted to, to leave you with a true uh, story about a woman who became a transformational leader and she learned from someone who she felt was transformational in her life. This is a picture of Sergeant Lorraine Prevo, and she's at Raymond James Stadium. And um, she was there because uh, General Schwarzkopf was uh, retiring, and she had the opportunity to serve under him. And uh, she thought very highly of him, and she was selected as one person out of two. There was a, another young um, sergeant that was picked, a guy, and they had one minute each to acknowledge General Schwarzkopf. And she said none of the experiences she had, she, one of the reasons she was selected was because of her bravery. And she said, none of the experiences that I had were as frightening to me as getting up in front of all those people, because this was televised around the world. So it wasn't just all the people in, Ray, in Raymond James Stadium, it was televised everywhere. And, um, and Lorraine wanted to thank Schwarzkopf because of his ability for her to, she experienced him as a transformational leader and as a supporter, and she has gone on to be quite successful herself. And I wanted to share with you her words because I think they were very, very powerful. Uh, many can command, but few can lead. Many can express themselves, but few can really communicate. Many can tell others what to do, but few model those things. You are, your courage inspired ours. Your integrity made the difference. You are our commander, our hero, and our friend. And when we stand to salute you, we not only salute the uniform, but the very special man who wears it. And all decorum was broken, and you can't see it here, but Schwarzkopf gave her a hug, and he had a big tear running down his cheek. There's a picture that's, that's bigger. So um, leadership makes such a difference in everyone's lives, and uh, I've really enjoyed our time together. I have a couple minutes for questions, if you have any. Yes? So I've been a leader. Ah. You know, I've been in the industry of healthcare for 20 years. And, um, you know, but I still have to work for quite a few years, unless they change the retirement age. Um, and I really want to know how we as older women leaders who have experienced all the things that you talked about today are going to be able to help the new generation that's coming up with all the dynamics that are going on right now. Mm -hmm. And how can we, as that old generation of leadership, help them to move up, you know, and, and in their careers as well as have hope? Because what I find happening, um, and this is primarily in the healthcare business because I'm in healthcare, is the hope is not there anymore. Like I had hope back in the day when I was growing up, you know, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And I don't see that as much with our younger generation. Um, and I work with a lot of nurses and a lot of respiratory therapists and mm -hmm. we have uh, therapists as well. And I see the hesitancy towards going into leadership as a matter of fact. So that's my Kay. question. Good question. Well, I'm sure some of you have thoughts, and I, I, Grace, I'm attracted to looking at you and saying, you're from that generation, and you probably have some thoughts. So I'll share mine, but if you had some thoughts um, that you would like to. So uh, I think the industry you're in is part of it. I also think that um, there are things that I've talked about today that are not quite the same factor as they are for younger generations right now, like uh, parenting, uh, uh, you know, um, more responsibility of the management of the household, um, you know, that, that's shifting a bit. And I think the environment that you're working in and the level of flexibility makes a difference. So that being said, you know, I, I think what you're asking, when people don't feel like they have a path and they feel like their work is dangerous, 
no matter what their profession, it, it compromises their motivation. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that I see is as a leader, it's a lot of pressure on you, how can you continue to find that common core where you're all working toward excellence together and not really accepting, you know, that the mediocrity, but working together that way, because that, that breeds, more, breeds more enthusiasm. Um, and, you know, but, but some of the things still do exist. Um, conscious bias, you know, I, I spoke to a group of female lawyers and uh, it's amazing. Lawyers start out at the same uh, level of male and female lawyers. And by the time they get to partner, there are hardly any women left. And the ones that, at the, the, this particular study, 60% of the women that made partner didn't have kids. And the others waited till after they made partner. So, you know, it's, it's, it, I don't know if there's a one size fits all, but I do see, I do see people um, evolving around um, being more inclusive and accepting of diversity, not just diversity of women, but diversity, um, you know, people of color, different backgrounds. Did you want to say anything about that? Or did I put you on the spot? Because you're a very talented HR professional and you're from a different generation than I am. Um, I oh, here, take the great. mic. Wonderful. Love it. <laughs> um, so one of the things I had a fantastic leader in my last company, and I think what helped like bridge the generational gap and helped me become successful was how open she was and how real she was. It wasn't like a boss relationship. It was like a friend. It was like a mentor. So even when we were having a bad day or something bad happened that the company was for, and I knew she probably wasn't, we had those open dialogues. So I think that really helps. And I have a lot of friends in healthcare and I know the mental toll they're taking. And I've heard some of them say, well, my boss says this sucks too. It helps me. So I think that that could be a good generational thing is just being open with them about your personal feelings. Thank you. Other, Do you see things changing or is it going to be the status quo? Do you see things well, changing? Well, thank you for, for asking me to speak on the world. But no, <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope things begin to change. I'm, I'm encouraged in some places, but other places I'm not. I'm very discouraged, you know, in terms of th that last McKinsey report, uh, for every 100 men promoted, only 85 women are, and then you get one out of four women saying that they're, they're feeling like they have to downshift their careers or, or maybe leave altogether if they can afford to. Um, so I, I, I think it's a strange time, and I, I think there's pressure you know, I've seen, for example, more divorces because some of the women, you know, that, that I know are, are home with the kids and their husbands and they're all working out of their home and they realize how much more they're doing and they get into arguments and they have to stay there together. So, so I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I hope that there, there, things will be changing, but I do believe in pockets of health and I believe in holding a space of being positive and surrounding yourself with other people that are. And that's why the peer support's important because if you're with someone who has victim thinking a lot, whether you're male or female, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna erode how you feel about yourself. And then when you don't feel great about yourself, you're not gonna feel great about leading other people. You're just gonna wanna get things done. So. Well, thank you for your time and attention. It's been great to be with you.